Hello everyone, my name is Marcos Bajo. I'm a master student of Cyber Security from University Carlos III of Madrid. And well, the presentation today is based on my bachelor thesis that I did some months ago under the supervision and advice of Dr. Juan Tapiador, who is a professor in computer science and also the lead researcher of the computer security lab here at University Carlos III of Madrid. Uh, by the way, he will be also joining us during this talk. So during our presentation today, we will be discussing how malicious actors can leverage EBBF for offensive purposes and how we have implemented one of the first ever EBBF rockets out there, which we call Triple Cross. So here's a quick overview of the topics that we'll be talking about. First, we'll discuss why this talk is relevant for the EBPF community. Afterwards, we'll explain the offensive capabilities of EBPF and how we have created our own rocket. And finally, we'll give you some tips and discuss some techniques about how you can protect yourself from malicious EBPF programs. So let's start with it. Uh, first of all, many of you may know already about Linux kernel modules, LKMs. Essentially, it's the old way of doing what we do with EBPF, when instead of running sandboxed EBPF code, with LKMs code is just run directly into the kernel. Now, of course, this means that because LKMs have full control over the system, they have historically been one of the most popular ways of building rockets. Now, nowadays you won't find LKMs available by default at any critical system, but you will definitely find systems with EBPF by default. So the obvious question and the one we are trying to solve here is, could a malicious EBPF program ever turn into a rocket? All right, so we keep mentioning rockets, but what is a rocket exactly? Well, it's a special type of malware that specializes in two main capabilities. First, rockets are known for being stealthy, meaning that they hide their files and activity from the user and any monitoring software so that they remain undetected for the longest period of time. And secondly, they typically include a backdoor and a command and control system, allowing attackers to remotely control the rocket from their own machine. Now, it's time to answer the question. Can it be of the use for building rockets? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, we found that during 2021 and 2022, there have been a series of reports about rocket attacks targeting system worldwide. VVP47, VPF doors, and Biode are all names of rockets that have already been using classic VPF filters and also modern EBPF programs for their malicious functioning. So our goal in this talk is therefore to uncover how the actors are leveraging EBPF for malicious purposes so that the community is aware of the risk and security researchers can understand the threat and protect their systems. So uh, let's start now with our analysis of offensive EBPF. We'll assume that you have previous knowledge using EBPF, also we have uh, very little time, uh, but we'll answer any questions after this talk. So uh, first of all, what you see here is the memory of a process. Essentially, it contains everything that a process is executing a program needs for it to be run. So this is the text section, which contains the instructions of the program that is being executed. And this one here is the stack. So here's where, where you can find variables and other data that is used during the program execution. So as you will know, if you have been using eBPF for a while, uh, we can create different interesting programs in eBPF, such as k probes, trace points, that allows us to hook the execution of the function and perform different operations in that context. So here you can see that our process is uh, executing the system called OpenAT, which is in charge of opening a file whose name we have stored in the stack. Uh, and then eBPF allows us to hook the execution either at the start of the kernel function or at the end. Now, once we are inside an eBPF program, we can read the arguments of the function. How do we do this? Well, we can. Uh, we have the BPF probe user helper, which read, reads memory at the user space, or the BPF probe read kernel helper, which reads memory at the kernel space. Now, the BPF verifier, as you know, restricts what and how you can read memory. But in our experience, if an EBPF program wants to misbehave and read out of these bounds, well, it's possible. So. The way we do this is by taking the argument of a hook function as a starting point in the virtual memory of a process. And then we can proceed to bring memory at different offsets from that starting address of the stack using BPF pro read user, as you can see here, performing what in essence is a memory scan. So as you can imagine, using this process, uh, we can find sensitive data such as secret tokens at the process. Uh, moreover, because there are a lot of other data such as return addresses, uh, the stack, which leads to the text section, uh, this is key for an attacker which seeks to hijack the process execution, as we'll show you. So it's not only that we can read memory from the same program, but also we are able to modify data at the process, uh, at the process virtual memory using BPF Pro Read User. As you may know, there are six restrictions over which memory sections you are read into, essentially only those mark as writable. 
So for instance, you could you couldn't modify the instructions, but you could definitely find yourself modifying data at the stack. So there are two issues with this helper. The first is that malicious EBP program, EBP program can write into the function argument, so the of the argument of the function before the kernel execution. So what happens if there is that you modify the kernel execution? And the second is that just as with the reading helper, we are not restricted to write only the function argument, but rather we can specify an offset from that address and write into that. So in practice, a malicious EBP program is free to modify any writable user memory will. And the takeaway here is that this is a very powerful, powerful primitive and will definitely show you some of, of its use cases in our block kit. So um, let's discuss networking programs. Uh, as you know, we can create EBP programs that receive the incoming traffic, such as XTB programs and also programs that monitor the outgoing traffic, such as TCA REST programs. Now, these programs can draw or modify the data at any packet, although in principle, as you know, and this is very le relevant, uh, we cannot create new packets. However, the issue is that we found that by taking advantage, advantage of the retransmissions mechanism of the TCP protocol, we can actually generate new, arbitrarily new packets by overwriting any packet with malicious data and then waiting for the TCP timer to time out so that the original packet is delivered to. Now, in practice, this means that uh, a malicious CDP program can potentially control and modify all the traffic on the effect machine, just as we will show you in our rocket. So let's see uh, now how we can weaponize these capabilities in a real rocket. Uh, we talk uh, about dangers of having the BPF Pro write user helper, write in user memory. But OK, many of you may argue that because the text section is not writable, then we cannot modify which instructions are being executed, right? So in principle, it's should be the dangers. Well, the truth is that you can actually modify the instructions being executed with this helper. And we'll, uh, we'll do this for uh, while implementing the library injection module of the rookit, whose goal is to execute a malicious library by modifying the memory of a process. So when you want to execute a system call in a process, you don't just get from the text section to the kernel, but rather for calling the system call, you first get from a special section in memory called the PLT, which which is some data stored at the GLT section, uh, which is used to find the path that leads to the kernel. Now, what would happen if we overwrite the GLT section? Well, this is exactly what we do uh, in our rocket. In this thing, we call GLT hijacking. So basically, we, we overwrite the global safe table so that the PLT now points to a malicious library of our own, executes malicious code, and then restores a normal execution. So if you follow the brightness here, we can see that the execution still reaches the kernel, but it goes through our malicious code this time. So the details are highly technical, but just so that you know, we perform five different steps during this attack. During this attack. Uh, so first we scan the stack using the reading helper vision offsets. And then we look at key functions at the GLBC library. Then we write our cell code in the code cave. Afterwards, we overwrite the GT section. And finally, we execute our cell code, we need to execute our malicious library, and then we return back the execution to the original process. So now Dr. Topedoro will be joining us to cover the rest of the rookie modules. Hello, everyone. Let's go on now and describe another of the rootkit modules, the privilege escalation one. Our goal here is to enable the rootkit to execute any arbitrary code with full privilege. Essentially, eBPF doesn't allow us to tamper with the pseudo system as a kernel module can do, but we can instead modify the data that the kernel reads from the pseudo -orst file. The idea here is that we inject a malicious trace point program that modifies the data read from the pseudo -orst file so that those programs the rootkit wants are always able to run as root. Um, also, we wanted to build a small proof of concept on how eBPF can be used to run malicious programs. I mean, we know that you cannot use eBPF to directly execute a program from the kernel, but what if you could modify existing execution calls so that you control which program gets executed? Well, that is exactly what we are doing here. We modify the exec v system call so that a malicious program is run instead. We do this following a special technique that we describe in the paper this talk is based on and the injected code can reproduce the original program execution and therefore this process is stealthy. Okay, let's now talk about the backdoor and command and control system of triple cross. As you can see in the, in the slide, this is also obviously a very complex system, but basically we have designed three components. First, we have one XTP program that hides malicious traffic and is in charge of executing the commands that are received from the network. Then there is a TC egress program that modifies the outgoing traffic. Second, we have a series of what we call backdoor triggers. 
Uh, these are special network packets which are designed to be stealthy and not to be detected by network defenses. We use this to indicate the backdoor which actions and commands to execute. We have also implemented several remote shells that can be executed after receiving a trigger. These shells might be used by the attacker to execute commands on the victim. We have implemented a classic, a classic reverse shell, a plain text shell, an encrypted one, and finally something that we call a phantom shell. In this case, instead of generating new packets from user space, what we do here is to make use of the TCP retransmission technique that we described earlier, so that both malicious and legitimate traffic are delivered using only one eBPF program at the kernel. We'll see an example of this during our demo. With respect to the persistent capabilities, we use two well-known techniques. First, we use the cron system to ensure that after our reboot, an automatic process will install the rootkit again. And second, we use the pseudo system to ensure that the rootkit is loaded with root privileges. To hide the rootkit files themselves, we included in the stealth module some more trace point programs that tamper with system calls and hide the files and directories belonging to the rootkit. The result is that the rootkit is both stealthy and persistent. And now it's time to see our demo. So we have prepared two visual machines, one in which we install the BPF rootkit and another one from which we will attempt to remotely control the rootkit. So what you see on the screen is a simple program that just counts up to six. The thing is that it makes use of a system call and we will attempt to hijack its execution via our GT hijacking technique. So first we start listening from the attacker machine and install our eBPF rootkit and then run the program again. As you can see, the program runs successfully, but our library gets injected. Our library then spawns a remote shell to the attacker machine from which we can execute commands remotely. Another thing we have implemented is the rootkit client. It's a program you can use to remotely control the backdoor. Here, for instance, we are creating an encrypted cell from which we can also execute commands remotely. And finally, we wanted to show you the phantom cell. If you remember our explanation, basically we don't generate any packets, but rather we overwrite the existing traffic and make use of the TCP transmission technique. So as you can see, we are not receiving any answer because there is no traffic at the infected machine. So we'll go ahead and generate some packets by visiting the eBPF IO website. And only now we hijack some packets. And as you can see, we receive an answer. And to execute new commands, the only thing we need to do is to generate some new traffic so that it gets redirected to our machine. So here you can see we received result of the command after uh, generate some, generating some new traffic. All right, uh, let's now briefly discuss some tips about how we could protect from uh, the type of malware that we have introduced. First, network monitoring. You could use an intrusion detection system or a firewall in order to detect suspicious communications belonging to the rootkit. But know that if, the, if these defenses are located at the endpoints, then the rootkit can hide incoming traffic with an XDP program. Second, we can also monitor the BPF system call in order to detect whether there is a running eBPF program performing some malicious activity. For instance, you could do this using BPF tool or eBPF kit monitor. And finally, please uh, keep in mind the principle of least privilege. You don't always need to give full root privileges to eBPF programs. If a program is only supposed to be working with a network, maybe it shouldn't be able to load keeper of programs and vice versa. We have capabilities exactly for this purpose. There is also another solution, which is something we stumbled upon while doing this research, and it's the possibility of signing eBPF programs. There is an article by Jonathan Corbett, which we are leaving here, and we believe it could be useful in order to ensure that only eBPF programs made and tested by a trusted party can be loaded into the kernel. Uh, we want to end this talk by saying that even if we monitor the network and the BPF system call and so on, there is still still exists the possibility of having a rootkit going unnoticed. In, the in theory, because the rootkit is already at the kernel and because eBPF offers virtually the same capabilities as an LKM, then it is possible for it to tamper with any monitoring software installed. And it could definitely tamper with any access to the eBPF system call too. So one takeaway take from this talk is that eBPF offers interesting offensive capabilities that we need to better understand and, and counteract. So we have reached the end of our presentation. This is the link to the Triple Cross project and the thesis paper where you can find all the details and all the sources about what we have been discussing here today. Thanks for having us, and now we'll be happy to take questions.